Bonda. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Donald Forrester. I'm Professor of Child and Family Social Work at um, Cardiff University and Director of Cascade Centre. Um, and I'm delighted to be uh, able to introduce uh, Professor Claudia Bernard. Uh, Claudia uh, was my first academic boss, as we were just talking about beforehand, and a very good uh, boss she was too, but is also a friend and colleague of many years standing. More importantly to everyone else, uh, she's also a leading academic, um, exploring the experiences of black and minority children uh, in relation to a variety of issues. Um, and I'm delighted that she's going to talk about the research that she and others have been doing around the experiences of black and minoritized children during the pandemic um, uh, and thinking about uh, their experiences and the lessons for now, as well as uh, lessons about what might have happened then. Um, I've had the good fortune to look at some of the research already, so I'm, I know it's really interesting, full of uh, practice and policy implications. Um, so, and I'm really delighted you've been able to join us, Claudia. So um, without further ado, Claudia, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for that very nice warm welcome. Um, just bear with me for a minute whilst I upload my slides, please. So um, before I started, I wanted to acknowledge my colleagues who worked with me on this um, research project, and that's Professor Anna Gupta from Royal Holloway um, University of London, Professor Monica Lankin-Paul from, from UCL in London, and the two research fellows, Dr. Anita Sharma and Dr. Teresa Perez, um, both who were based at Royal Holloway University of London. What I'm going to talk to you about first, I'm going to um, first give you a brief overview of the background and context and methodology for the research before I move on to talk about the some of the key findings and some of the recommendations. So the, the, um, community, the consortium of practice on practice of well-being and resilience in Black, Asian, and minority ethnic families and communities got together um, in 2021, at, at the beginning of 2021, through the Black Female Professors Network. So we didn't know each other. And you can see a photograph of the whole team um, in, in relation to the bigger research project, looking at the combined impact of um, racism and discrimination and the pandemic on black and racially minoritized um, communities, families and communities. And there were in total five work packages. This, this research was funded by the, um, the ESRC and there were five, five work packages. The first one, the impact of the emergency COVID act powers, um, the work package that I'm going to talk to you about that I was involved in, the psychosocial impacts on black and minority ethnic children, young people and their families. The third work stream looked at care, caring and carers um, with a particular focus on older racially minoritized people. The fourth package looked at um, physical activity and nutrition. And the fifth package um, looked at communication and research, cr researching create creatively. So the fifth package um, basically took the findings from all the work packages and translated those into films, theatre production, graphic arts, and a, and a whole range of things. At the end of this um, presentation, I'll give you um, the links to where you can access a lot of the reports and findings and resources from all the work packages. But my focus today is really on um, children and families. And so our objectives were was to examine black and Asian and minority ethnic young people and parents strategies for coping with the combined impact of COVID-19 and racial discrimination on their everyday lives taking into account support structures that exist in families, friendships, and services. Um, 
we wanted to engage with black and racially minoritized professionals within statutory and community services who supported uh, racialized families during the pandemic. And we also, participation was a key principle that underpinned a lot of our research. So we wanted to work in partnership with uh, young people to co-develop the outputs and the strategies for building resilience and promoting the health and well-being of um, black and minority ethnic um, children and young people and families during and beyond the pandemic. And we, of course, we wanted to make policy recommendations that outline how to build back better in a culturally responsive way that meets the needs of ethnic minority children and families. So we, uh, in terms of um, our, our overall methodology, we kind of um, created a youth engagement panel. So that included um, a pool of 10 young people, of black and Asian and dual heritage backgrounds, age 16 to 20. And we um, recruited them from London, Birmingham and Leeds and they advised, they gave advice throughout, um, throughout the research process. And they gave feedback in, in the initial stage, they gave feedback on the research tools. And they gave, um, I'll talk a little bit later on about how they um, helped us use, use the key themes emerging from the um, analysis of the data to um, translate that into a photo book and graphic artwork. And we also worked with a photographer and an artist um, to help us engage young people and also help us translate the findings into accessible outputs. Because an Im important for us was to make the findings of the research as accessible as possible. So in addition to the standard report executive summary, we also, and, and you know, the academic papers that will follow from this, we also wanted to um, make the findings accessible, particularly to young people. And we, you know, so uh, hence the photo, we've got a photo exhibition that you can see online and I've, I've given the links to that, that you can go to that in your own time. We did a lot of graphic artworks. We worked with a photographer. Um, some of the some of the words from the transcripts were used um, in a theatre product to make a theatre production, which was um, in, shown in London um, over the past few months. Because in the in the broad um, uh, overall research team. Um, it was very um, interdisciplinary. So we had um, anthropologists, we had a psychologist, we had uh, an academic who was from a law background, sociology, hours of so social work. Um, one member of, of our team, prof the professor from UCL was a pediatrician by background. So so we were able to bring our, our, our um, our disciplines together in very interesting ways to think about how we can not only do research but engage often very resistant and invisible com communities to put their voice at the center of what we were doing. So our research was a qualitative um, piece of research and we used um, purposeful sampling, snowball sampling, um, and we we conducted semi-structured interviews and focus groups. And you can see there a breakdown of our sample in terms of six to six children and young people aged 12 to 19. We also interviewed 55 parents or carers. Uh, the carers were, met, were, were mainly kinship carers. And we, in, we also, um, gathered data from 19 professionals. And those professionals were social workers, teachers, youth workers, um, uh, et cetera. And we, we did a combination of online and face-to-face -face interview because um, we started project in 2021. 
which you know if if you can remember we were still in some um, forms of lockdown and we gathered the data from Birmingham, from Leeds, from London, from Cardiff and from Milton Keynes. And we used, uh, in terms of the data analysis, we used thematic analysis. So that's just something very briefly, just saying something very briefly about the methodology and the background and context. Again, you can look at, you can read in the report for a very, a, a much more detailed um, outline of the methodology. So just something very briefly about the creative methods. And as I'd said before, we um, we developed a photo book. So just, just briefly, we once we'd gathered the data and did the original the analysis of the transcripts, we gave some we gave the themes emerging from the trans transcripts to the photographer who then worked with um the youth engagement panel to um, explore with them how they might, um, what sort of images would capture the themes that were emerging from the from the analysis. And as I go through the um, as I go through the slides, you will see some of the photographs that the young people who um, engage with us in the youth engagement panel help to kind of. Um, translate the, the themes into those those images. We also worked with a graphic artist who, um, during some of the focus groups, the graphic artist was also involved in the focus groups and sort of um, creatively um, developed images that conveyed something about the, um, the, the experiences that were being voiced in the focus groups. And for us, those things were important for engaging for engaging um, the young people. So uh, as an example, this is some of the, the work from the graphic graphic designer. And some on on the right, my right, some of the photographs that were taken by the photographer that we worked with. Before I go on to um talk about some of the findings, I wanted to just say something very briefly about community cultural wealth. So the community cultural wealth um, theoretically framed our approach to the research. And the reasons, one of the reasons we chose this theoretical framework is that central to community cultural wealth is the notion of the, the cultural knowledge, the skills and assets that racially minoritized people utilize to make sense of lived experiences that are rooted in racialized processes. And in terms of three key elements of community cultural wealth, um, aspirational, navigational, and resistant capital, we drew on that to better understand how oppressive systems affect the experiences of racially minoritized groups. So um, aspirational capital encompasses how individuals and groups may have hopes, dreams, and aspirations despite the persistent inequities that um, they're surrounded with in society. And I think education is a good example to illustrate the ways that um, racially minoritized parents, who some, some who may not have had a lot of formal education, but are, are usually very ambitious for their children in relation to, to, um, to achieve in, in relation to aspirations. Um, and then navigational capital is concerned with the skills and attitudes that's used to navigate unsupportive and toxic environments. And resistant capital refers to the means by which black communities engage with social justice issues to secure equal rights and collective freedom. And as I go through the slides, we'll see examples of the ways that the young people talked about and, uh, and those areas manifested in their lives, although they weren't using the language of community cultural wealth, but in terms of their experiences, what they were talking about were those very, very things. So five key themes emerged from the analysis of the data, which is young people's support and well-being, coping strategies and resilience, parenting in a pandemic, social supports, 
support networks and building trust and safe spaces. So in terms of support and well-being, young people told many stories of how the pandemic negatively impacted their mental well-being. And isolation and heightened anxiety about parents' employment and income, dealing with the bereavement and grief, separation from school and friends, and conducting their lives online. And it was important for us to um, remember and Again, a significant number of the sample of children, particularly Asian children, the children from Asian background, lived in um, intergenerational households. And a lot of those children had um, relatives who were abroad, who were also being affected by the pandemic and, 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 and had a lot of, um, we know from, from, from a lot of research that racially minoritized groups were disproportionately affected by death particularly in the early phases of the pandemic in 2020. Racial and minoritized group were also disproport disproportionately um, impacted by, they were the workers who were more likely to be in the sort of frontline services um, and the more likely to be in the services where they were not eligible for um, the furlough. So they were disproportionately impacted. And for a lot of our sample, the children were living in very cramped housing. And, and those were children who were coming from the population who were eligible for free school meals. So during that during that period when um online, when, when children were being um taught online, this seriously impacted um impacted particular families, this portion number of the families in our sample because they they had lost out on those um those things that would have given some support to the family they're also um disproportionately impacted by the the digital um divide because some of those um children were living in household where there might just be one device that had to be shared around three or four um children um those who were living in very cramped housing um you know had no space to really study uh in in the ways that you know those families who were, were probably more affluent and had you know a study and had spare rooms and had several several um laptops those kinds of things so they were they were particularly impacted um by housing by by um in terms of income by the digital divide etc and those groups of children relied very heavily on community networks for support. Um, and often those community, ne community networks might have been in their church, in their mosque, in, in, in their communities. Often those community networks work in very, um, on a voluntary basis to provide. And the two, two services that we um, accessed in different parts of Wales, one in Cardiff and one in Newport, was um, a boxing clubs, two boxing clubs. And they um, we've made some films with the boxing clubs and we're going to launch one of the films at the end of the month in, a, in an event in London. And clips of those films can be seen online and I'll give you the, the link to it. But the, the boxing club um, was very instrumental in how it, um, came together to support families around things like food and um and and emotional and and sort of mental support so i think we wanted to stress that a lot of the support came from not from the statutory services but from um community organizations grassroots organizations that were often not funded or very badly funded and without a doubt we argue that the prior experience of racial stereotypes in education settings exacerbated uncertainty over examinations due to COVID-19, particularly that, that first year when the um, GCSEs and A-level results were going to be um, assessed by teachers. You know, the, the anxiety for those young people was very high because um, their concerns about the way bias and racism impact the way judgments are made about. So there was a lot going on for, uh, that affected young people's support and well-being.
In terms of education, as I said, I've touched on some of that already in relation to the, the digital divides, space in the home access to internet and parent ability to support education was again, um, particularly impacted, particularly where some of those parents, um, English was not their first language or they had not been educated, their formal education had not taken place in the UK, et cetera. And here we can see some of the, the, from the voices of young people in terms of what they were saying. So peer support was critical for young people in terms of friendships and emotional support and isolate, isolation. So one um, young people said things like, I didn't have any contact with friends for a month. Um, and another one said, it's easy to just ruminate and think about all the bad things that could possibly go wrong. And if we hold in mind that in that first year of the pandemic in 2020, uh, when we went into that first lockdown, when at that same time, um, the murder of George Floyd happened and the, um, the rise of the Black Lives Movement. And in those early days of the pandemic, there was a lot of racism that was conveyed in the media about you know this the idea is that it was black and asian and minority ethnic families who were spreading the virus um there were a lot of racism that was sort of some of it was very explicit and some of it was implicit in the media so if we think about that context for young people the the, the young people at that time and i'll go on to talk a little bit about how they particularly the how they responded to the George Floyd um, murder and the, the rise of um, really addressing racism at, at, at that time. And some of the young people talked about, um, particularly during that first phase when we were only allowed to go outside to exercise for an hour, um, the young people talked a lot about the over-policing at the disproportionately impacting of young black men. So some of the some of the young men in the sample talked about after a while they felt afraid to go out to exercise because they were just constantly stopped by the police. They were just constantly harassed by the police. Um, so the common experience of being stopped and questioned by the police during lockdown affected participants' feelings of safety and often made them feel less able to go outside to exercise or to get fresh air during the during the uh, lockdown, and here we have um, what one young um, seventeen year old young man said about go going out to for a run, and he says you'd get stopped so quick. Even like even like with me, I could barely make it around the corner. I could I would literally go around the corner, and they would stop me straight away. They would see me in my running shoes and running kit, and still be like, "Where are you going?" You can't argue, they'll think you're lying. I remember one time here, I told them I was going on a run. I thought they were going to be calm and then they were like, oh yeah, go off, go on, do your run. So I started running and, and I swear the car just followed me for 10 minutes because they thought it was lying. Um, so, you know, that just gives you an example of some of the experiences. And those experiences were not one-off. They, they were very common experiences across the, across the country, across where we gathered the data, that these were the experiences of some of the young, particularly some of the young young black men and young um, Asian men. So the prominence of the Black Lives Movement um, in, in 2020, um, which amplified um, racial injustices during the, during the first lockdown, uh, really encouraged young, the young participants to speak candidly about their identity and belonging and get, and engaging in local, national and global activism aimed at tackling systemic racial discrimination. And for some, it also um, invited a re-evaluation of friendships. So those friendships that were racially toxic um, in terms of um, naming of race and racism. And one young person, a Bangladeshi young female says, and many of their peers would call me the P word and stuff like, I had a few white friends and they were really nice people. They, they, but they used to use slurs, that's all. 
but I say that's all, but it's very bad. But now it's it's calling out racism, like it's more defensible, especially because like race is not talked about as much as we think. It's just it's just little microaggressions. And like sometimes many of us look past that because we don't want to create a, a commotion. So they so young people talked about those kind of racism and microaggressions that they um experience. And a lot of them talked about the the ways that because of the Black Lives Matter movement, it gave them a, a voice and a platform to really kind of um understand their experiences, but but also to be able to name their experiences. So it was very empowering for a lot of the young people. And in terms of microaggression, some Asian teenagers in Newport explained that talking about race to peers was like arguing with a brick wall and increasingly used to draw comparisons with the USA. And one of them said, people who people who argue that in the UK it's different. We're inclusive, we include everyone. It's like, no, you don't. It's this it was this notion that, oh, it's it's worse in it's worse in in the US. It's not as bad here. So um, you know, they talked about converse conversations would morph into the oppression Olympics, you know, who is more who is more oppressed, you know, that hierarchy of oppressions. One of the teenagers in, in Newport, and we we this was in a um a focus group that we did in Newport. Um, another one teenager says, although the conversations were difficult, but they saw it as very positive overall. Um, and again, this is what this young person had to say. Um, because the Black Lives Movement happened in lockdown, because of how much media impact, social media pack, impact of it, or rather, or rather how much social media had an impact on it, it became even bigger, even better, even stronger. I think that's one thing I'm grateful for with COVID, the fact that actually messages did get across, across to this time. And I've touched already on the importance of support from community hubs, because that, for a lot of the young people, that's what they had to um, rely on, was the community hubs in their, uh, in their youth groups, in their church, in their mosques, in sports club, etc. And that gave them a sense of safety, a place of belonging, uh, and provide some of the very basic needs for those those uh, marginalized families who didn't have access to um, furlough and other, uh, in terms of when their finances were really impacted by the pandemic. And I think it's important for us to really um, understand and understand the importance of what a sense of safety means for racially minoritized children and that sense of belonging because if young people don't feel safe if they come into your services and they don't feel safe they don't they don't feel a sense of belonging then um you, you really are not engaging them you really are not meaningfully engaging them so spaces that really enable young people to to give voice to the, these experiences were really important and that's where they were used in their youth groups, their church, their mosques, etc., to give voice to those um, those experiences. I'll briefly give go just go through some of the findings from parents. Mainly, they were mainly mothers in our sample, and they talked about the major upheaval in their daily lives. For the, for some of them, having children and husband at home all day, lack of space, particularly for those who are living in multi generational households. Um, the um, food resources for schoolwork, the constant arguments, financial worries, job insecurity, and particularly um, those who are impacted by uh, no recourse to public funds, um, were all kind of major, major traumas for, for families. Um, they talked about um, GP access and the, the lack of um, resumption of basic healthcare services um online the, the online learning and the challenges of supporting children to stay motivated and for that for some not being familiar with the uk education system and most importantly because those sample of children and families were disproportionately as i said come from those those socioeconomic backgrounds where they more they were more likely to be on the front line in the health services and in the transport services uh, in those services that where they had no option 
to work from home. They had to go into work. There was, for, for the children in particular, they talked about their anxieties and fears of their families um, catching COVID and being vulnerable um, to COVID. Because in that first year, if you remember the debates, in that first 2020, when there wasn't the, there wasn't the um, proper PPE equipment and the the black we know we know now from the research that the black and ethnic minority health workers who are working you know the cleaners the porters the the people in the health institution that are doing all the the dirty work um where they they were last on the list on the list to get proper ppe so they were very vulnerable to catching uh covid and and that's what ch the children and young people were constantly anxious about that their their family members so in terms of parenting in the pandemic and combat, combating structural and societal inequalities, anticipating and receiving support, there was the sort of families talked about the impact of racist assumptions and stereotypes and the, and the hostile in, environment and treated, some talked about being treated with suspicion, being questioned by the GP receptionist before being able to access any NHS services. Um, seen as less deserving um, and fear of being stigmatized and judged as being a, a bad parent. And if for um, families who had no recourse to the public funds because of their immigration status, that fear of a hostile um, response were all areas that really um, added to the layer of stresses on, on families and children in the study. And in terms of building tr trust and safe spaces, now it didn't come as a surprise to us that the, the young people and families were very mistrustful of the police services, because we know that the police, are, in black and ethnic minority communities, particularly black communities, disproportionately are brutalized by the police and young people at that as well. But what came as a surprise was the ways that the mistrust was that was felt about um, social services, but most worryingly about schools as well, that children, a lot of the black children express feelings of not feeling that schools were safe spaces for them. And, you know, and we, we've, we saw that in England, in London, in 2022 with Char Q, who was the child that was strip searched in school during her, when she was having her period without um, an appropriate adult being present. Um, so, but, but what came through very strongly in, in the research from the young people, as well as the parents, was that mistrust of, um, and of services and also feeling unsafe or in spaces. Uh, so the need for safe spaces to support mental health and well-being was a consistent theme running through the participants' accounts. They powerfully articulated the challenges by foregrounding issues concerning justice and fairness and the ways in which their experiences were impacted. And importantly, their narratives elucidated a deep mistrust of public services, including the police, the justice system and social services, and most worryingly, in these schools were not experienced as being safe spaces. So we need to um, we need to pay attention to that. So in some of the recommendations um, about the changing future for children, young people and families, some of the recommendations we're making is that children's services providers must, must adopt an intersectional approach for understanding and addressing how their policies and practice impact black, Asian and minority ethnic children and young people. And an intersectional approach is, is important because it helps us to understand the ways that, um, as well as children's race, but the, their cultural backgrounds, their um, religious backgrounds, their gender, all those things, how it comes together to frame um, experiences um, during COVID and post COVID, because I think we haven't, in terms of the long term impact of COVID, I think we haven't seen the we haven't seen the worst yet in terms of the impact on on Black and Asian children's mental health in 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 the future. 
And national and local government must ensure long-term and sustained investment in place-based community services that offer early help, culturally appropriate support tailored to meet the needs of local Black, Asian and minority ethnic population groups. Because as I said previously, a lot of the support were, and a lot of the culturally appropriate support were being provided by community hubs and, and grassroots organizations. And those grassroots organizations, they need to be funded, funded properly. And youth service should be co-produced with young people and include provisions of safe spaces and community-based youth and mental health workers accessible to local Black and Asian minority and, and ethnic minority children and young people. And so we need to be also be thinking broader than broader than thinking about the supports around mental health that can be provided in schools and camps. We need to be thinking also about other spaces um, that might be more appropriate for young racial minorities people to feel um, safe to um, explore the challenges that they have to confront in their lives. And um, these are just some of the photographs that were taken from the themes emerging from the research. Um, you'll have these slides, so you can, you'll be able to go through it in your own time to actually read um, in, in, in your own leisure to, to digest a lot of the information because there's a lot of information um, that I've gone through. And in, so in terms of just to wind up now, Children and youth service providers should recognize the importance of support at grassroots levels with insider workers. By insider workers, we mean representation that um, for young racially minoritized um, people, they need to be able to see um, people who look like them in, in service delivery, and most importantly, in, in leadership. And the police as a key statutory safeguarding partner should find innovative ways to actively engage with Black and Asian and minority ethnic children and young people to understand and address issues of racism for building trust in those communities. And that's where um, local partnering, part partnership, safeguarding partnership, really needs to be addressing some of these questions. And children's social care, education and health services must engage with Black, Asian and minority ethnic children and young people and, and their families to address racial discrimination and lack of trust experienced by many who use their services. So, so the question really is how do you engage in those conversations in your services uh, and your sectors um, to address um, racism that may manifest in, intentionally or unintentionally in your services? And briefly, to this is the final slide. I wanted to say again, say something briefly. Come back to com community cultural wealth. Community cultural wealth lens furthered. It helped us in our analysis because it furthered an, an intersectional analysis to provide a more nuanced appreciation of the compounding factors that undermined resilience in racially minoritized youth. It provided us with some critical tools to utilize non-deficit ways to recognize how youths harness their own resources and strengths to cope with stressful life events when their identities and self-worth were constantly brutalized by racism. It helped us to facilitate a deeper understanding of the significance of community and neighborhood networks of support that can be critical for buffering against adverse mental health consequence. And finally, when considering how to intervene to support racially minoritized youths, to cultivate resilience, community cultural wealth can help to shed light on the individual and community assets that they utilize to overcome barriers to, to survive and thrive. So it's how do we value the resources that racially minoritized um, children and families bring to make sense of their, um, their experiences and understand their experiences? And finally, these are the links where you can access a lot of what I've talked, I've drawn on to illustrate what I've talked about. Um, and I'll pause there and um, open it up for some your contributions and questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, some really shocking examples of 
individual's experiences and some really powerful uh, testimony. Um, and some interesting suggestions and important suggestions for how we might do things differently. Um, I, I have some questions in the comments box al already. Um, but I actually wondered, Sally Holland has asked a couple, uh, put a couple of questions in the chat, uh, but I wondered, Sally, whether you, if we unmute you, you could just say them rather than me reading them out. I think they're both really interesting questions. Then I'll come to Abid. Helen's asked a question, and if, if you're happy to talk to it, Helen, put your hand up and I'll do it that way. But if you'd rather I read it out, don't put your hand up and I'll just read it out. So, so Sally, do you want to, uh, I'm going to let you ask two questions uh, and then, then we'll go to Abid. So Sally first. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah, that's great. Great, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. That was really important and fascinating. And um, I'm joined here today, I hope, by because uh, I can't see them, um, uh, but uh, I know that my second year social work student, master's students have signed up to this module, uh, to this seminar, because it really fits well with work we've been doing um, on all sorts of things, including um thinking about um how to sort of further our um our anti-racist and um uh, non-discriminatory practice um so the first question i put in um was just thank you really for 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 what you've included about the um about yosso's um uh theory theory, theory framework uh, which is something that we we read and discussed in class, but some of the students were um, asking lots of questions about the how this because she uses um, lots of educational examples exactly how this might link to social work and social care settings. You sort of started you did answer a lot of this before we got, after I posted my question, but I just wondered if you could elaborate any more on links between. Um, this uh, her free, uh, theoretical framework mm. and um, how social work staff can work with these understandings in practice mm. and yeah I'll do you want me to say the second one as well Donald? I think that's enough for Claudia for okay. now <laughs> and then you can ask your second question. Thank you. Very very briefly I uh, in terms of uh, Yossa's cultural cultural wealth model community cultural wealth model um, it's a lot of it is linked to education because um, her her um, analysis was a critique of the French sociologist Bordeaux. A lot of it was a was a critique of Bordeaux, who talks a lot about social class, but says very little about racism and how that impacts impacts experiences structurally and individually. Um, and my. As I said in the final slide, what community culture, in terms of making links to social work, what community cultural wealth does, it gives us, uh, it gives us some critical tools to, um, uh, community cultural wealth is very much rooted in critical race theory and um, intersectional analysis. And what it does, it just gives us some tools to, um, use a different lens to actually analyze some of the things that may not have been, if you were using Bordeaux's model in terms of social class, you would not have an understanding of how racially minoritized um, people who are, who are navigating racism every day, how they, how they maintain their aspirational goals for themselves and their children how they navigate, how they, so the, the things you might look for in relation to um, how they might develop resistance. So when we, um, when we think about um, things that families may do in relation how they, how they may challenge social workers to in, in terms of the assessments that might be made of their parenting that might be deficit based, I think critical, so, Community cultural wealth gives us a lens to look for strengths in families, things that may be overlooked. So, for example, um, the ways that um, families may, um, the ways that families may use our community organisations, the ways they might use their faith, the ways the ways they might use their traditions. Um, those are things that are often 
perceived as being deficits or being abusive to parents, that isn't to lose sight of the fact when those things can be used, cultures and traditions can be used as a justification for, um, for um, abuse. But it helps us to also, a co community cultural wealth lens, help us to look for the strengths in those as well. Uh, and that's my, that, that's my, um, that's how I make sense of it as a, as a theoretical tool. It helps us to look at some different things um, in relation to what families may bring to their parenting in a, in a stressful, um, yeah. racialized uh, context. Thank you so much. I think I tried to say all that in class, but I think you've said it much better. So I, I think we'll, I'll just set this recording as the as of this webinar as <laughs> the preparation for next next year. And that was great. I was really trying to emphasize, and we were discussing in class, you know, how by emphasizing racism and some of the stats on um, um, economic inequality, et cetera, we can end up having a completely deficit lens. Yeah. of racially minoritized communities so so that's where i think yossa's um theorizing is really helpful um thank you and the other one was um we've been looking as well at a human rights framework um for social work and just really my question is do you think it's helpful for professionals to overtly use the language of human rights when engaging with children and young people um i noticed i noted that one of the young people was quoting um a human rights lens when to frame their experiences in one of your quotes? Yes, uh, uh, and a very short answer. Of course, we have to be using human rights and children, and particularly children's rights, because particularly when we're working with children from racially minoritized groups where um, families, um, families who may have different, you know, as I said before, have different traditions, different cultures and different um, belief systems, which informs their parenting approach and how they treat their children that may sometimes bring them to the attention of child welfare services. We have to be able to, you know, have those respectful conversations with parents, with parents about, um, to put it in a simpler way, what they can and can't do with their children, uh, you know, and, the, and their children are not their property. But also, we have uh, we have to not lose right, the sight of of the rights of children and young people. Great, thank you. I agree. <laughs> I, I do too. I've got a book about that coming out next year. Um, <laughs> next, next up is Abid. Uh, if, if you're willing to ask your question, I think you're unmuted. Excellent, Abid. Hi. Um... Thank you, Claudia. That was really, really, really interesting. And sadly, I had to dash out and do a couple of other things. So I may have missed this. But my question, and it's a short question, but a lot of meaning. Um, do you think COVID led to an increase in equalities and racism? Or that it merely highlighted what we have a society and a profession have tried to ignore and was almost a useful reminder? I mean, I, I heard Kay and Andrew talking about the murder of George Floyd almost being useful in that it woke us up that we'd forgotten all that stuff well it it woke up a lot of organizations but i think some of them have gone back to sleep you know because in 2020 everybody was right everybody and their dog was writing us an anti-racist statement mm. um and it would be useful to go back now and to see how a lot of that has been translated into action um, so a lot of performance, I call it performance work, was done in 2020. Some have taken that further. Uh, it, with regards to the first part of your question, I think what co what um, COVID did was to amplify, um, it amplified racism. And it, it kind of just reminded some of us that um, what institute, you know, the, the historical oppression that racially minoritized groups have experienced COVID-19 amplified it. But I will also add that I think it it increased uh, racism as well mm -hmm. um, for, for certain groups. We saw that in with, with regards to um, Southeast, the impact on Southeast Asian groups who were um, often racially abused for causing, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, you know, those, those mm -hmm. um, and, and the ways that in, particularly in the early, 2020 when the media was very much communicating the message that it was it was black and asian family people who were spreading the covid mm. virus because they they weren't staying at home in in and and um 
and isolating, you know, and, mm. and those were the groups who had to be out there to work because they they didn't have the luxury of being able to work at home or being being ha having furlough. So there was so I think it it amplified it. It really shone a spotlight on it, and it also I think it increased it as well. Thank you. I think we, we have time for one last question um, from Helen. So over to you, Helen. Hello. So I hope you can hear me OK. Yep. Um, I come from a, a youth justice background and I'm very much orientated around data, but I'm going to try and open this up a little bit to make it relevant to everybody. So if you look at the data in Wales for the formal youth justice system, we actually have very low numbers um, who are from racially and ethnically minoritised groups. And that means that quite often this, uh, we have statistical suppression. So it makes it hard to find out where we've actually got potential issues of overrepresentation. So we're not like Birmingham or London. So how, how best as practitioners can we be supporting young people from those groups when we don't, I'm going to put it bluntly, when we don't look like them and there's possibly no one in the workforce that looks like them? Do you have any advice at all? Well, I go back to the um, I go back to the point I raised earlier on about the conversations, the bold conversations that need to be taking place in your workplace, in your teams, your 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 the questions that need to be asked from your senior leaders in your organisation as to what are they doing to create a culture um, where you are trying to address those issues. That that's one side of it. Then the other side of it, well, how are you how are you engaging those communities to actually find out from them why aren't you coming to our services? Um, and in terms of the research, I'm not a quantitative researcher, so I um, you may have the quantitative researchers may have better um, may know a lot more in terms of how you actually address that that um, small samples. Um, but I, and and what you do about that to in to increase uh, those uh, sort of numbers so that you have the research evidence. What I do know, it's not good enough for, um, it's not good enough for quantitative researchers to say, well, we didn't, you know, the we didn't have enough data, blah blah blah. So we can't really say anything much. There is there is stuff you can do, and then there is stuff you can do qualitative to find out. So I think there are very there are different places, different sort of conversations need to take place to really address the problem. Um, but and it starts for me, it starts with the conversations and the bold questions that needs to be asked. And I think that's where cultural, the community cultural wealth and intersectional analysis provide the tools to facilitate those conversations. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. There are resources on the um, YJB resource hub about engaging with different minority groups, which are actually quite good, but they're still very much written as if there are significant numbers, um, which is a little bit frustrating, I think, for some people in, in Wales. Yeah, but the it doesn't matter about the numbers. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the bold conversations, isn't yeah. it? And actually not yeah. be, being afraid to ask the right, the quest, yeah. the pertinent questions. And make, I always worry about tripping up over my language and getting things, the correct language when referring to, to race and ethnicity is very difficult yeah. for me. Yeah. I think for the, I think that's an, as, as I would expect, Claudia, an excellent answer. And for the social work students and other practitioners here, uh, the people we work with are the experts on their lives. So having bold conversations with them about how race uh, and culture are impacting on them, what's important to them, how we can be sensitive to it, is something we should always be trying to do, I think. Um, so those sort of bold conversations need to be things that we have to do in organisations, and also with communities, but also with the individuals we, we work with. Mm. Um, that, that has been a fantastic uh, presentation, really, really great and really interesting questions. But unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you, um, Claudia, for giving the time. Um, so thank you very much, Claudia. If everyone was here, I would suggest a round of applause, but I imagine they're all sitting in their chairs, uh, internally applauding you. Thank you very much, everyone. and. Um, Thank you. Thank you for thank you for uh, um, your attention as well, and thanks for the invitation. It was our pleasure.